Bruchim Aboyim. We are now on the second tape on the topic of prayer. Um, something that we do as Orthodox Jews three times a day. Uh, something that the world recommends under the heading of meditation. It becomes uh, one of the purposes of prayer is to subjugate ourselves to God by admitting one's reliance upon him. So by praying to God, we really acknowledge that he's the one that runs the show and that without him, nothing really works. Um, there's a real benefit to that. It takes the pressure off of you. If you really feel that it's up to you, that what you do will really decide the final end of everything, the pressure is immense. But if you are, so to speak, a manager in the world, you have a job to do and you have to do that job well, but it's really God's world, then all of a sudden things get a little bit easier. You can walk away, so to speak, and you can recharge your battery. You don't have to take it with you 24-7, because in the end it'll be what God wants it to be. What he expects of you is to be in attendance, to do the best that you can. You know, if you have two children, one who's a superstar. From the moment he leaves the womb, everything he does is great, talented, gifted, and becomes somebody. And you have another son, not quite as gifted as his brother. But even though he doesn't have the same gifts, what you see from him is that he's always pushing, always trying to be better, always trying to exceed his potential. Which one of the two really define you? Which one gives you the most enjoyment? And the truth of the matter is, it's not the son that's a superstar, because you know, you really had little to do with it. But the son that hustles, the son that pushes, the son that makes mistakes, that comes to you for advice, that listens and grows, he is what makes you who you are, and you help to make him who he is. And that's really the relationship that God wants with us. God has angels. They're perfect. That's great. But he wants a relationship with us, an imperfect human being. He wants us to pray, to make that connection with him. Imagine, if you will, if the president was speaking and he was in town and somehow needed his tuxedo. And his tuxedo was at the cleaners and they give you a call. And they say to you, can you please do the president a favor and go to the <clears throat> cleaners and pick up his, his tux? And you agree. You take that tux and you drive to the convention center and you hand the tux to the president. Well, before you did that, the truth of the matter is, though he is the president and you are a citizen of the country, you really have no relationship. But if you do the mundane act of just picking up the president's tuxedo and handing it to him, you now are connected to him and he's connected with you by a simple act. And if you continue to do other things, the bond between you become greater. And that's what prayer does for us. This continual connection with God every day. And for us, three times a day. And many times we don't realize the, the gift that God gives us this prayer that we do three times a day, some angels pray to God once in their whole existence. We pray to God three times every day. We are allowed to have this private audience with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. And prayer is really set up much like a symphony, especially the morning prayer. In a symphony, the third movement is where all the action happens. Everything builds to the third movement. And when we pray, we begin with the Sukkot de Zimra, the prayers of praise to God. Then what we call the Shema Yisrael, accepting the yoke of heaven. And then, at this movement, this third movement, where in a symphony things get loud and things move, we do just the opposite. We don't make any sounds whatsoever. It's the quietest prayer that we have. We put our feet together. And we speak in a very low tone so only we can hear. Only we and our Father in Heaven. A private audience with God Almighty. And we really don't even realize 
that God anticipates, waits for that moment, and so should we. To speak to God, to speak to God, and to know that God listens. All prayers are answered. In fact, we have a t-shirt that says, push. Pray until something happens. That a person needs to just pray, believe in that, in that fact. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, God loves our prayers. And he orchestrates situations to get us to pray. The, um, they say that our, the mothers of Israel, Sarah, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, Three out of the four were barren. Only Leah was able to have children, and she was the one who was oppressed, and therefore God always takes the side of the underdog. But what's interesting is the reason given why the three, three out of the four mothers of Israel, who were righteous women, I mean, top, of the, top of, the, of the class, the reason given why they were barren is because God loves the prayers of the righteous. Which is strange. What do righteous people do? They pray. <laughs> so why would God have to make them barren to get them to pray? And the answer is, even if you're a righteous individual, when you pray and you have a need, you pray much greater. It's more sincere. It's deeper. It comes from a different place. And this is why every day we pray for good health. Every day we pray for a livelihood. But the truth is, even if we're praying for good health, when we're sick, we pray much better. And this is a fact. So many times God orchestrates situations to cause us to turn to him in true prayer. Not just lip service, but prayer that comes from the depths of our soul. It's interesting that Shlom HaMelech, King Solomon, when he built the temple, first temple, he asked God that when a Gentile, when a non-Jew brings a sacrifice to the temple, answer his prayers. But he did not pray that when a Jew brings a sacrifice, that God should answer his prayer. The question is why? And the commentaries say because King Solomon wanted to make what we call a Kiddush Hashem, glorify God's name. So when that non-Jew comes, he sees that when he prays, God answers. The Jew, on the other hand, understands that the truth of the matter is every prayer is answered. But sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes the answer is not yet. In fact, prayer, if you take the word P-R-A-Y-E-R, is an acronym for please respond after you, meaning God, examine request. Because in our naivety, in our silliness, just like children, what we ask for is not always what we need. In fact, not only is it not needed, sometimes it's detrimental. We think we should be here. We think we should have this. I guess lotteries prove it more than anything else. Most people that win lotteries, though they think that money is the answer to everything, find it's not. An old saying, the best things in life are free. And this becomes so true. We see not only the power of prayer, we see with Kizkiyo, the king, who was told that he would die by the prophet Yeshayo, and he turned to the wall and he began to pray. And God gave him 15 more years, even more than he had originally. So the prayers of the person who is sick, who has a need, come from the depths of the heart. Especially with tears. Prayers with tears are always answered. But again, you need to know always answer does not mean yes. Because sometimes the right answer is no. And that's where God is a parent, and we need to know that as parents. Sometimes the greatest kindness you as a parent do for a child is to say no. But we want to be our kids to love us. So that's pressure for us to say yes, but wrong. We need to have the strength of character to parent instead of look for friendship. Find that with your friends. We need to know that everything that we do comes from God. The prayer, part of prayer, the power of prayer is to be able to believe in it. 
It's interesting. How is our relationship? How do we prove our relationship with God? Again, we were talking before about the Shmon Esrei, the standing prayer, some call it the Amnida, which is the focus. When the word tefillah, prayer, is mentioned, it really signifies that one prayer of the standing prayer where we stand before God like an angel. What's interesting, every Shmon Esrei, every one of these prayers, has the same setup, is broke up the same way. The first three blessings are blessings of praise. The last three are blessing, blessings of thanks. <clears throat> Much like you would if you met any great person. First you would praise him. And the middle part is 13 requests. So first you'd praise him, then you'd make your request, then you'd thank him. So that's how it is broke up. Now we do that. What's interesting though is that on the first three of praise and the last three of thanks we are not permitted to make personal requests. And if you look at what the wording is in the last three, the three blessings of thanks that we give to God, we really ask God to return the service from the t to the temple. Then Modim, we do thank him for what he does every day. But then Sim Shalom, again, we ask him to bring peace and to grant us all that we need. But I just got through saying that we can't make requests. And two out of the three blessings are definite requests. So how can we say there are no requests made in the last three blessings that we may have in this standing prayer? And it's interesting. Our relationship with God is totally different than that of a human being. When you have a person in need, a friend, a family member, and they come to you for help. And you give it to them. And they come once and they come twice. And, and you're a benevolent person. And you continue to help them. The greatest news for that person and the greatest news to you would be when that person comes to you. And with heartfelt honesty, they say to you, I want to thank you for all you've done for me. I no longer need your help. A child to a parent. A child finally graduates college. He can now take care of himself. No greater joy. My son took me to a baseball game. I kept the ticket. He was able to afford to take me to the, to the game. It was a great moment for me. But to God Almighty, it's just the opposite. The greatest gift, the greatest compliment you can give to God for all that he's done for you is this, what we say in the Shmon Esrei. To say to God, I want to thank you for everything that you've done to me, for me up till now. And I want you to know, what I realize is that I need you more now than before. And that's the way we thank God. All God wants from us is what every parent wants. And I'll repeat the theme over and over again. God wants to be relevant. He wants to be a part of our lives. He wants us to know that when we have a problem, we turn to him. And he creates scenarios for that to happen. There was a rabbi who gave a class in California. And someone came to him after the class, right, Manus Friedman, and said to him, explained to him why he had become religious. And he had said he was driving down the coastal road. And he lost control of his car and it went off a cliff and landed on guide, guide, uh, guide wires. And he walked away without a scratch. And then he said, after that, Rabbi, I became religious. And the rabbi looked at him with a smile on his face, kind of chuckled, and he said, and so let me get it straight. Your car went off the cliff, landed on the guard wires, guide wires, and because of that, you became religious. And he says, exactly. And the rabbi said to him, did you ever think about who threw you off the cliff? God orchestrates what happens to us so that we come closer. That's all he wants. And that's the basis of prayer. You need to believe. When you believe that God will answer your prayers, you become a powerhouse. And he will. Ask and you shall receive. And that's what God's about. A benevolent father who wants to give you all that he can. God willing, next week we'll talk about the basis of the month of El and what to pray for on the high holidays. Thank you so much for coming. God bless and be well.